resonant. 
been known, uh, Sister Wendy, the art popularizer, has said that he was the masterful painter of flesh. And perhaps one of the greatest uh, British uh, painters of the 20th century. His works emphasize the entire human situation and all of its fleshly manifestations as biologically inescapable. Leonardo da Vinci, we have to talk about Leonardo. His painting, The Mona Lisa, is like really, really famous. And she lives under shatterproof and bulletproof glass at the Louvre in Paris. And she's noted for her enigmatic smile and her the eyes that follow your eyes wherever you go, however you look at her or admire her. Bill Cubbett's study deserves much the same close scrutiny that Mona displays much more amplitude. I mean, I, I'm saying Kobe's study displays much more amplitude, so to speak, than our, our Mona Lisa, but it is her face and its perceived attitude and message that merit our attention and rivet us with meaning. So today, South Bend-based Bill Healy one of the founders of the Fire Arts Gallery in downtown South Bend is a fittingly local artist to be honored for this masterwork, as fellow area artist Mike Slavsky con considers it. Today, it joins the permanent collection of the Midwest Museum of American Art, representing American art in the time of COVID, even though she is not wearing a mask. <laughs> Thank you, Bill, for this masterwork. We are very honored to be able to present it to the museum. Well, nothing short of a scholarly presentation. I would expect nothing less. A for you. A plus. So thank you. Did you write that, Michael? Very good. Um, give us a minute here. You can talk quietly amongst yourselves. Eat your candy bar unless you've already done it. And Randy and I are going to reboot the, the singing up here, and then we're going to start our lecture today on our library. So just give me just a few seconds.
What would Alan think of the COVID stuff? We'll have to speculate. And I'd like to present Michael, who can share with Bob this wonderful parting gift today for your generosity and your engagement with our intellectual mission. I thank you on behalf of Randy and myself and the trustees putting Bill's work into the collection for all of eternity, perpetuity will be important as a marker, even though that we think we might like to forget this, we'll never be able to forget this. This will always be ingrained with us and we'll probably still be wearing masks for another year or more, maybe two masks. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Brian Byrne, director and curator. And so uh, this talk today uh, amplifies what has been said previously by my colleague Randy Roberts last week in his tribute to Hoosier Women Artists and also the film on the Overback film that we started out with three weeks ago. So this is sort of our little pod of uh, talks that we think you would enjoy and bring some enlightenment to you about our collection. The unfortunate situation is that we have no examples of olive varieties. You've heard me mention that if you were here prior to this talk. Um, our esteemed patron, Dr. Stephen Cohn, at one point owned four, and a large one he had donated to his alma mater, DePaul University. So uh, he's been tasked now with trying to find us an olive brush. Um, there are a few out there, and there's relatives still uh, living in Santa Fe, in Indiana, and uh, Washington, D.C. And so I, this was brought to my attention by another colleague searching out information on another artist. So when, when we post these emails and or when it goes to our Facebook or Instagram, you know, people read that and they see that and they sometimes come forth with the generosity of information. So who knows? We may end up with an olive brush down the road. They, they can get pricey, uh, what I've seen. Uh, and then yet, the smaller watercolors, and watercolor was one of her two chosen uh, mediums. Um, watercolor itself, and then she did oil painting. But her second most recognized work was done in frescoes or wall murals. It seems like the Southwest was particularly uh, suited for that kind of work. Although I would remind you when you see some of these images that are coming forth of her working on a scaffolding, and she was working on murals up into her 60s. I will just be turning 63. Oh, by the way, I got my first shot. I get my second one too And I thought about that when she was 60 years old, hanging from these scaffoldings in these uh, kind of heeled shoes with a scarf wrapped around it. It had to be oftentimes very hot in the Southwest, although it's a dry heat, right? Uh, well, let's start. And get through this. And I will say that my reportage today is based on two books and a little bit of internet research. And I received this book. And, you know, I read many monographs and biographies, some autobiographies on artists. And this is called Olive Rush Finding Her Place in the Santa Fe Art Colony. It dates from 2016, 2017, so it's pretty current, and it's exhaustively and richly detailed, so much so that I can't even begin, and I've highlighted this copy, so it, uh, if you ever have a chance to handle it or read it, uh, you'll see that I, I line quite a few things out. Second book, and you can't talk about Modern art or art in the 20th century Southwest, particularly Santa Fe and the house, without discussing Mabel Dodge Luhan's enclave of artists and writers and poets. So 
those are the two books. So Al Rush was uh, born in the 19th century. She lived to be 93 years old by the time she passed on in 1966. And uh, why she's a part of our Indiana grouping of women artists because she was born in Fairmount, Indiana. Anyone ever been to Fairmount? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, yeah. It's the home of legend James Dean. Also, David L. Payne, who was considered to be the father of Oklahoma, which Payne County is named after. Also, Bob Sheets, former director of the National Hurricane Center and meteorologist, as well as Jim Davis, the creator of Garfield, and Mary Jane Ward, who wrote the book The Snake Pit, which was loosely based on her life, that Olivia de Havilland uh, gave the title role to in 1948. And so I kind of show you an aerial view and a downtown view because I've been to Fairmount. I've been to the James Dean Museum. I've seen its grave. And they have an annual James Dean Festival, or they did before COVID. And they have a huge, big, classic car drive in. And the whole town is just, you can't hardly walk through it. And uh, what was in the water in Fairmount, Indiana, you know, that subsisted there from the late 19th into the 20th century, we don't know. But Olive came from Quaker background, Quaker roots. So if you know something about the Quakers, and I can get, get with the Quakers, I once had a religious, uh, uh, what do you call it, survey, you know, you go online, find out if you're this or that, and it turns out that my belief structure sort of aligns with liberal Quakers and Mahatma Gandhi Buddhists and uh, Native American spiritual. So I thought, hey, I thought I just started out life as a Methodist. <laughs> okay, well, Quakers, and this is one of the creed that Elizabeth, or excuse me, Olive Rush lived her life by. And Quakers rejected elaborate religious ceremonies, didn't have official clergy, and believed in spiritual equality for men and women. Quaker missionaries first arrived in America in the mid-1650s. We know the most famous Quaker down there is Lincoln Penn. And I'm showing you a map of Indiana with some of the counties outlined in red, including Wayne County, which is down towards the center, which is where the Overbeck sisters live. And they have a little Quaker background in here. And probably, beyond the film, why their mother didn't want them to marry is because... Uh, you guys got in the way, you know, of their, of their success as professionals. So uh, Quakers believed in equal rights. They were pacifists, and they were, played a key role in the abolitionist movement, the women's rights movement, uh, those suffragists. So uh, they believed that God resides in every individual, providing them the ability to discern the will of God. And that's the way Olive Rush lived her life to do good and to do God's will. And she was born on this farm. Sorry, that couldn't blow that up anymore. That's called Rush Hill. So if you looked at that aerial view, and if you've ever driven to Fairmount or driven between Auburn and Fort Wayne, it's flat as a pancake. So if there's any elevation whatsoever, I guess you need to take advantage of that. So Nixon Rush, Olive's father and her mother, uh, had seven children, and Olive was the fifth in that lineup of seven, and a couple of them, of course, did not make it into childhood or even adulthood. Nixon Rush was a very famous Quaker evangelist, traveled all over the Midwest, was very well known in his day, and he and his wife, though, both embraced the idea of artfulness and of sketching and of supporting art. Quakers did not, generally speaking. They thought art was a frivolity. But Nixon Rush was kind of a maverick in that respect. And uh, he had a yearning to be an adventurer, too, and he liked riding around and going to different towns and preaching. And uh, so 
They actually, he is one of the six generations that Olive Rush can trace her lineage back to William Rush, the first professional sculptor in America, in Philadelphia, and to uh, Dr. Ebekaziah Rush, I can't remember his first name, who signed the Declaration of Independence. So it goes way back in American history. And I show you a couple little Quaker figurines. We actually have four. We have two pairs like this up in the Overbeck collection. So, and is it any wonder then that Olive Rush at age 16 was sent from Rush Hill to Richmond to study with at that then Quaker founded high school, which later became a college, and we know it today as Earlham College. And the dean of the uh, landscape painters in that part of the country was John Elwood Bundy. We have two of them up there above the dune scene. So you take note of that. And John Elwood Bundy was very uh, taken with Olive Rush and thought she was sort of a prodigy and encouraged her at the tender age of 16 and then 17 to show her work in national competition or national shows in, uh, out east. And um, that idea persisted and was again used possible, was amplified by other successive artists like Ella Follett, Fraser Andrews, known for short as E.F. Andrews, who was an American painter and portraitist and uh, after two years, or less than two years, at Earlham College, she begged her parents, and somehow they found the money to do this, to send her to the newly, fairly newly founded Corcoran School of Art in Washington, D.C., because she had a sister who had married a doctor that they were living there, and so she had a place to reside. And so, if I could uh, use, I, I don't think that this... Let's go back there. Um, if you see the gentleman sitting, there's two gentlemen really sitting in the middle of this group of young ladies. And the gentleman, which is, he's a little bit older than what this uh, engraving portrays him, E.F. Andrews, right there in the center, he's got a white beard, probably can't see it from back there. But Olive Rush is sitting to his right on the floor in a kind of a revered teacher pupil face. Uh, mm -hmm. Why did she ponder it to live in Sweden? Because Duncan Phillips was again one of those individuals when he started his private museum and people he saw walked through it one day and he saw a, a large number of people sketching in the gallery. That's how you learned if you didn't enroll in a school or you didn't have the chance to go to a men, uh, Sunday night class, favorite class, you copied. And so he decided to start this school and eventually built a little building and attached to the Phillips Collection Museum, what became the Phillips Collection, and uh, definitely wanted to have co-educational because his wife was an artist. But this is not typical of the time. Um, this is, uh, again, um, around 1895. So it's starting, it's starting to develop more, but more on the East Coast, more in New York, and particularly at Olive's next stop, which will be the Art Students League. You can see two token young men in the background. Yes, I think those are the janitors. <laughs> um, so her next big, and I've got to move this along a little bit, but her next big <coughs> impressionable moment and learning moment is when uh, May Wright Sewell, who Randy mentioned, a great suffragist from Indiana, sent her a letter and had selected two of Olive Rush's watercolors to be included in the women's building in the 1893 World's Fair. Columbian Exposition in Chicago. So I'm just borrowing some images Randy had overlapped with, and there's A. Wright Sewell, and you never told, what did you say, Randy? You never told her no. <laughs> and so Olive and our family went and visited the fair. 
and it was a huge educational experience for her eye opening never to be repeated and soon thereafter eighteen ninety three eighteen ninety four she started studying at the art students league for three years ninety five in the winters of ninety five ninety six and eighteen ninety seven and i'm showing you typical then classrooms at the art students league in that time frame and the group at the right the man sitting in the center is robert henry whom she knew and she particularly liked george luke's i left my notes somewhere else randall but i was going to highlight in our collection the connections to be drawn are between the ash can school which of course breathed the first social conscience into realist painting and decided not to paint the rich people but to paint the people of everyday lives people of the street that would have suited her quaker outlook and uh and of course there is a class there of all ladies and they have a nude lady there that's modeling for them and then otherwise to the top left you see that you started out maybe in your first year just drawing from classic greek uh, sculpture plaster casts of sculptures and while she was there she made contact with harper's weekly and started her profession in illustration and so she was now starting to bring in money so it wasn't just draining money out of the family coffers she was adding she maybe was even sending money home and when she could she went back to rush hill to see her mother her mother really wanted her to leave the big city did not want her young 19 year old daughter living in new york city by herself but olive had that gumption and that stick to itiveness that quaker kind of uh of uh, intrepidness to go out into the great uh, forest of humanity and uh, apply her sensibilities and and to learn education was key in all this case now, i know of artists that once they get their mfa they think they've got it all made they've learned it all <laughs> and we know for a fact that if you're an artist you never stop learning <laughs> you shouldn't and uh, every day brings new challenges and uh, while horace greeley that started the new york tribune was long since passed she went to work for the new york tribune <coughs> and illustrated special supplements and particularly images of children and this went on for up until about 1899 then she returned to philadelphia and in philadelphia <clears throat> i say she returned there because she went there briefly to visit relative a brother who was a doctor and then she came back to live with he and his wife calvin and this is kind of what philadelphia might have looked like with no 